Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, on behalf of Institute of Medicine and Law, uh, I am Ravindra Mangal, and I welcome you all, uh, the panelists as well as the viewers, for this uh, national consultation on legal and regulatory framework in telehealth, with special emphasis to issues in data privacy, data security, and data confidentiality. Uh, we have a great team of panelists today to discuss on these issues. And the chair uh, chairperson for this event is Justice Ravi Tripathi ji. Uh, unfortunately, he has just uh, come back to me saying that he might be a little late in joining us for this session, but he will be joining for sure within some time. Justice Tripathi ji happens to be a former judge, High Court of Gujarat. He was the member of the 21st Law Commission of India and is currently the chairperson, chairman of the Gujarat State Human Rights Commission. Uh, the moderator for today's session is our own uh, Mr. Sundarajan. And uh, Mr. Sundarajan happens to be the CEO of the Institute of Medicine and Law. And he is a seasoned professional with vast experience in legal, in technology, in publishing, and in healthcare. Uh, if I can count a few notable achievements in his professional career, which is spanning almost 22 years, he has managed the largest co-sourced legal editorial operations for Thomson Reuters, and he has built and successfully managed the world's largest open access medical journal publishing platform for Walters Clovers. Uh, he has also set up and built technology and content operation of the world's largest search engine company for Wipro. Uh, with these few words, I hand over the charge of the program to Mr. Sundarajan. Sundarajan, sir, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Raviji, for those kind words. In God we trust, but the rest must bring data. Uh, this is a phrase that we've been hearing for a long time now. But with these recent changes, I think this phrase is also about to change. In God we trust, but the rest must bring encrypted data. I think that's the direction that we are going in. On the 25th of March, India released the uh, telemedicine practice guidelines. A great step, but I think it leaves a lot of questions to be answered. On the 5th of July, IML conducted the National Convention on Medicine and Law. Telemedicine was one of the sessions, but it was felt that data privacy and data security are issues that must be dealt with separately. It needed a different team to discuss, people who have worked on it, uh, and from different parts of life. I mean, including people from the IT are where required. And hence this session. Uh, we have an esteemed panel here today. Uh, I will introduce the panelists as we go around, as their turn comes up. Uh, our chief guest, Justice Ravi Tripathi ji, will join in some time. So when he joins, I will take a couple of minutes just to introduce him, and then we will go ahead with the session. So the first round will con will have about uh, five minutes each for all the participants, for all the panelists. And uh, the second round will be a, a rapid fire. Now, depending on how much time we spend on the first round, we'll go with the second round. The closing remarks will be by the chairperson, uh, Justice Tripathi ji. Uh, keeping the time zones in mind, uh, there's a request for our uh, panelists from the U.S. to go ahead first. So I invite uh, on stage uh, Dr. Srinivas Suturi, a very seasoned uh, healthcare executive, uh, an entrepreneur with 20 years of uh, practicing in the U.S. in hospitalist and being an internist. Uh, he has extensive career in the healthcare sector with a deep understanding of KPIs and metrics uh, for uh, hospital providers uh, and payers. So over to you, Dr. Srinivas. Thanks, Sundar, and uh, thank you all for uh, inviting me to this panel. Um, so I, again, my name is uh, uh, Srinivas Vittori. I'm a physician, practicing physician here in the US practicing over uh, 20 years. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of background. I, did, I grew up in, uh, Can in Canada, um, but I, and I did my undergrad at uh, University of Toronto, went back to India for uh, medicine, 
And then I came back and did my postgraduate in uh, internal medicine at one of the Columbia programs back east. And then I finished up in the West Coast. I also have my MBA from uh, Northwestern Kellogg. And so as uh, Sundar mentioned, I've uh, you know, been a practicing physician, but I've been in, in and around healthcare IT for the better part of the last 20 years. Um, so I don't claim to be an expert in, um, in, in privacy or data, but you know, in, in the US here, it's a very litigious society. And so the privacy laws, uh, what we call the HIPAA, you know, the Health uh, Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, as well as uh, uh, protected health information, they're taken very seriously. I mean, I take it very seriously, both as a clinician, as well as a uh, business associate um, owning these uh, technology and services companies. So, you know, I, I, I think um, what, what's really important is that, uh, you know, COVID has been a game changer uh, all around the world. And so there's been a paradigm shift here in, in what we, you know, in the consumer, in this case, you know, with patients and their willingness uh, to use uh, tele-technology going forward. And so with the added use of peripherals, IOTs, wearables, uh, artificial intelligence, ML, it's gonna reshape the practice of medicine going forward. So with all this comes the need to be very diligent about how we protect data and uh, concern about data breaches. So, uh, you know, since uh, we're gonna be talking a lot more from, um, you know, my esteemed colleagues about uh, the India, uh, like what the rules and regs are gonna be in India, I thought I'd give you a little bit of uh, facts uh, that are going on here in the US. So, um, you know, a single, the way uh, that penalties work here is a single breach has a maximum of up to $1.5 million per year. And even individual fines can range from anywhere from $100 to $50,000 for each instance. So there's a really good article in the um, Physician's Practice Journal. And it mentions that in 2019, we had about 418 breaches that affected roughly about 25 million patients. Uh, in 2018, uh, actually that was, sorry, the tw 25 million patients were in 2018. Um, there was a server hacked uh, by what's called the AMCA and it was actually undetected for about eight months. Um, and about 72% of that 25 million um, was because of the AMCA breach. And it included two of the largest laboratories uh, here in the US. And uh, so to say the least, the parent company ended up filing for bankruptcy. So um, I just wanna end it off by saying that, you know, in these discussions that, were, that are about to take place, and as you're deciding policies uh, to be made, it's extremely crucial that, um, you know, there are regulations, that we do enforce them, but we have to be careful not to be so prohibitory uh, to make physicians not want to use this technology, which is going to allow healthcare in places never imagined before in India. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Srinivas. That was short, crisp. Uh, but that's a very serious, uh, concern there, a developed economy and uh, a huge data breach there. I will now call upon Dr. Rohan Sequera, uh, founder and CEO of Quera Technologies. Quera Technologies, if I have pronounced it right. A cloud-based electronic health record and telemedicine platform for doctors and patients. Uh, he is a visiting professor in medicine, Howard School of uh, Medicine, Boston, ex-honor major in the United States Army Medical Corps. Uh, battalion surgeon and unit in command. Uh, we would uh, love to hear from you, Dr. Sikhi. Thank you, Mr. Rajan. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this wonderful galaxy of stars presenting here today. Uh, I've been a practicing physician for the last 25, 30 years, and uh, some of it has seen action in, in war. And yes, it's been, a, I think what we are facing also right now is a different kind of a war. And uh, I really appreciate this wonderful galaxy of uh, speakers. Uh, it's very important, like what Dr. Bhutturi just mentioned about uh, privacy and data laws. And I think it's something uh, 
which is absolutely the need of the hour because uh, like you mentioned from the 25th of March that the government came out with regulations for teleconsultation in India. We already have one high profile case in India where a, 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 you know, a lawsuit has already been filed against a doctor for uh, you know, uh, misusing the system of telemedicine. It's, it's been in the news recently. And I think uh, data privacy laws and everything is very much in the nascent phase in India right now. And I think uh, it's absolutely the need of the R right now to have a really, really strong framework in place to, to make sure that, uh, you know, these laws are maintained and patient data and privacy is also established. And at the same time, uh, there's a lot of debate on the ownership of data. That needs to be a certain also, uh, how would you interoper how you, how would you ensure interoperability? Because right now, like Dr. Thuli also mentioned, this would be a wonderful, wonderful tool for the government to look at to bring healthcare right into the interiors. Today, I think there's an internet facility right into the deep interiors of India, and because of a lack of uh, doctors today, uh, the government recently also came up with a guideline where they were allowing uh, you know Ayush doctors to take the place of uh, the, you know, the allopathic doctors. I think this would be a fantastic bridge gap uh, solution where it could be a co-consultation between consultants and uh, healthcare workers in the deep interiors to provide absolute point of care into the interiors. And I think this policy is something which needs to be taken on a, on a war footing. And I, I, I think that's exactly where we are going. <clears throat> So I'm grateful for the opportunity to be a part of this uh, conversation. And I hope, uh, you know, I'll be able to help uh, in, in whatever way I can, my two cents. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Sequeira. Great points raised there. This is a great opportunity for India to take healthcare to the rural areas as well. But as you pointed out, there's already been a, a lawsuit on a, on a doctor. So we have a long way to go. Yep. I yep. will... Now invite uh, Dr. Suraj Thirwani, who is a third generation doctor, a second generation MD homeopath by choice. And he has very keen interest in technology. And I've seen him for many years in the past. And he has done some wonderful work uh, relating to healthcare technology, uh, including some projects and EHR related apps, uh, including one for the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and has worked very closely with the government of uh, Himachal Pradesh and has also built two apps. He's the CTO and director uh, of uh, PI, a platform for intelligent edutainment, which organizes edutainment-based uh, cultural mm -hmm. events catering exclusively to doctors. Uh, welcome to the panel. Dr. Suraj Dirwani would love to hear your comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sundar, sir. Uh, sorry, uh, I hope you're able to hear me clearly because my screen keeps telling me it's unstable. Great. Uh, is this where you just want me to give a brief comment or is this where I'm supposed to speak for my five minutes first? You can speak for your five minutes now. This is uh, now okay. a session. Great. Thank you so much for that clarification. So I'll keep it brief. I After hearing what we had uh, discussed yesterday evening, there were some thoughts in my head that I just wanted to share and bring across here. Uh, Security per se, in my opinion, is always inversely proportional to convenience and ease of use. So if we look at banking as a sector as the most important, whenever we try to make it secure, there's a dozen other locks that we need to clear. You want to look at your statement, uh, you have to first open the app, put in a fingerprint, put in an OTP, sometimes to make a transaction, it will suddenly ask you a secret question, which even you don't remember when you had put what is your childhood nickname or something like that pops up, you know, HDFC and ICIC are infamous for this. So security is inversely proportional to convenience and ease of use. If we have to secure things, we have to be ready to jump over things. Now, that's where doctors sometimes don't really enjoy uh, the secure apps. You know, they want data quick. They want data easily accessible. And uh, for, for example, in one of our apps, we had put in a local lock, meaning we felt that what if the doctor's phone is picked up and the app is anyway carrying all the data offline, that all data will be visible to someone who's just managed to snatch the phone. So we put in another lock, but the doctors were not willing to use that. They were like, no, I need access to this part more uh, instantly. So one problem, uh, somehow we need to, build over and, uh, and make them understand from day one, make doctors as well as patients and everyone involved in the chain understand that why there is a need for security. 
security then brings on privacy since we are talking of data privacy today primarily speaking i feel privacy as a concept is is uh, unfortunately a little difficult to explain to indians i mean we come from a place where sometimes we are packed 20 people in a room and let's be honest we've all been there may some of us are fortunate we may not have seen those times but privacy as a concept to indians is difficult the other end of the scenario also i can give an example uh, we often pay money to buy a house in the top most floor thinking we'll get good breeze and good sunlight when you do pay expensive money for that and you reach that floor you realize oh there's another building right across and that guy can step straight into your room so then you end up putting up curtains uh, which i feel defeats the purpose this is something like that what we are ending up with here you want the data quick but you don't want it seen by everyone so now you got to put curtains for that beautiful house that you just bought um, on the top floor uh same goes for uh, data privacy when it was coming for example your grocery store uh, 20 years ago when you went to your local grocery store he knew you've come on the 5th of the month you're going to need 2 kgs of rice and 1 kg of dal and you were fine with that you know you felt nice you felt familiar about it but today and now if amazon tells you that oh you're buying ketchup maybe you're out of bread then you suddenly feel oh my god this this is a breach of my data privacy now people know things about me that uh, i didn't want them to know uh, suddenly you get that feeling right same goes for uh, your internet service provider and he knew what ip you were watching he knew what sites you were accessing your local internet guy but now today that has changed where airtel and jio are tracking exactly that and selling it to the marketing guys that oh netflix this particular show is very popular and so many people are watching it all over and suddenly you become part of that data matrix this whole scenario has changed over the last 10 years and the four people the four aspects that i want to touch on this is the doctor the patient the technology side and the analytics side so now from the doctor's perspective and believe me i am trying to speak with uh, the least possible bias because at one end i have been an entrepreneur who's trying to sold or uh, tried to sell to doctors and it's been a tough call and at the other end of course i am a third generation doctor so i have uh, four doctors in the family and they have their own uh, set of uh, concerns as well now when we were uh, uh, the main complaint with doctors is that they really have no idea how to guard this or they don't even sometimes realize how vital this information is this patient build information and they always or rather we always come back and say that we would rather pay our time invest our time in handling the workload Uh, in diagnosis and treatment rather than sit and do paperwork or you know attend to all this so technology needs to step in somewhere and make things easy for them sure we did that we tried that but you would not believe the number of doctors who actually came out and requested disable accounts module in our system they just didn't want it they said this is data that uh, you may ever give the it guys i don't want them to know how much i'm earning per day so we had to actually give a disable button there then there is the set of uh, general practitioners who usually tend to dispense medicines and don't actually write a prescription we had to give them a button to hide their prescription from the patients while still ensuring that the prescription remains in the system so that if there is a medical legal case we can pull it out of there but these kind of uh, variant uh, different variants exist in the market where the doctors have different demands different doctors have different expectations from your uh, software and this to meet to get on a common platform is going to be a bit of a challenge but but the patient side once it comes in since uh, our ehr guidelines are very beautifully designed to say that the property it belongs to the patient the data belongs to the patient but nobody is making him realize that also as a doctor again a little bit of bias creeping in i would expect that the patient be transparent and honest uh, the data is his of course he has a right but there has to be something that says that it needs to be shared properly many times you go to a cardiologist without telling him that you've been to an orthopedic the orthopedic has given a painkiller your blood pressure is shooting up the cardiologist does not know that you've not carried the file you've not shared that information and the whole diagnosis goes for a toss vice versa holds true the uh, cardiologist has given some drug which your gp does not know about and uh, things go for a toss so transparency even though the data is the patient's somewhere there needs to be something that says that if you are coming to a doctor it needs to be given you cannot choose to selectively hide things as per your convenience because we'll get into trouble we need all of it to make an informed decision and take an informed call and uh, 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 i mean they can't delete i mean uh, someone yesterday was discussing about delete as an option does anything ever really get deleted on the internet i i have my doubts on that as of today uh, even a company like ola does not allow you to delete your account your account just cannot be deleted they so many companies that have recently mailed to us sent back saying there is no option to delete the data we we'll deactivate your account that's the best we can do you are not going to get a delete out of it uh, if we have to look at where the world has gone with blockchain 
and bitcoins is there really an option to delete is that data not vital supposing i've got a wrong blood report and i want that gone from my file forever but i think it's still important that we know that you had gone for a blood test at that point of time or you had been to a particular doctor who diagnosed you wrongly i don't think data can just be uh, deleted and uh, you know gone from the cloud then comes the fourth aspect that to bridge all this, we need technology. Now, the famous uh, Norse mythology of Heimdall, who is the gatekeeper, right? Who has the keys? My biggest concern with this in technology and out of experience is who has the keys? Who has the keys to the gate? Who has the keys to the locks? It's not usually the owner of the company. It's some engineer who's, who's, who has access to the cloud, right? With the AWS server, with the PPK keys on his laptop. He's the guy who has access to the cloud. It's not me. If I'm the owner of the company, I don't know what the doctor's up to. But the guy who's actually in charge of the ser server architecture, the guy who has access to the AWS account, to the Azure account, to the cloud platform, that guy has access. Now, of course, one thing is encryption. Data is encrypted from this device to this device. Data is also encrypted on the server, right? So that is the answer that we usually get, that you make sure that it's all encrypted and they can't read. And every time it goes to the app, it will get decrypted. There comes my fourth challenge, analytics. What do we do with this data? Of course, some people tend to sell it. Sure, okay, that's not right, fine. There's got to be white masking. But this data is absolutely essential for analytics. I mean, we had a breakthrough where we were able to, uh, you know, kind of tell doctors in a particular area that we are seeing a rise in number of dengue cases in your area. Why were we able to do that? Because the diagnosis of dengue was pinging up on the system more frequently and we could map that to the geography area. If we start encrypting everything, how are we going to run analytics? What is the framework for that? What is the legal lens for that? How will AI ever function if we just start encrypting every single piece of data? How will we join the dots? Uh, is something that I would really expect that we get some kind of very clear cut guidelines that what data can be masked, what cannot be masked, uh, under what circumstances can we use that to build on our analysis? This is what I would expect from the guidelines, from be it the government, from a legal perspective, from a technology perspective, that somewhere we need to make the doctor understand and tell him that boss, this might be inconvenient to you, but this is how it's got to go, just like you're doing banking. You need to make the patient understand that this data, although it is yours, is very important and needs to be shared in a particular manner. And then the technology needs to embrace around it and it must lead to a greater good by the means of analytics, by means of AI and uh, some predictive inputs. Uh, that's it from my end. Thank you so much. Very nice. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Dhirwani. So concept of privacy is alien to India. Technology platforms have to be more tightly secured. And of course, we need all that data for, for analytics. So greatly put. Uh, before we uh, move to uh, Dr. Uh, Rajiv Joshi, our, our next panelist, um, I would like to inform the panel that uh, we have amongst us uh, Justice Ravi Tripathiji. I would like to uh, extend a very warm welcome. I am Sundar Rajan, the CEO of the Institute of Medicine and Law. And welcome to the panel, uh, Dr. Tripathi. Justice Tripathi, I'm sorry. So we move to Dr. Rajiv Joshi. Uh, he is the immediate past president, Indian Association for Medical Informatics, health data interoperability professional, certified by HL7 and SNOMED City uh, International, chairman of the e communication cell, uh, Indian Medical Association Pune, computer applications in uh, medical professional, and uh, Take My Care Private Limited is his organization. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Joshi. The mic is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, discussion. And I'm very happy to get introduced to many stars in this field. We have got knowledge from legal area as well as healthcare IT as well as in medical uh, facilities. So to add to my background a little bit, I am uh, doing LLB now. And I completed two years. So I have little additional knowledge about law. And in addition, I've got a software company which has uh, given software to 300 plus uh, doctors from all specialities and super specialties. So I would just start my talk with Indian context as has been discussed by Dr. Srinivas that in US and other countries, HIPAA is very important and uh, data confidential is very important. In Indian context, patients don't bother much about the secrets of information. In fact, 
I myself would get very angry if my relatives don't come and meet me in the hospital. So that is how our culture is there. And we don't bother much about the secrecy of the data. Everybody should know about, I am having diabetes, I am taking this medicine, and that type of system is there with us. But at the same time, we have a glaring example of uh, uh, companies which book online air ticket and sell data to online cab booking companies, and the cab booking companies take from 1x to 2x to 4x charges as the flight time approaches. So that is misuse of data that is happening when it comes to electronic data. And in healthcare, we have to protect the healthcare uh, privacy or data privacy because the data can be misused in such a manner that individual patients also may get affected. Not only that the, finance, the, uh, the pharmaceutical company may get profits, but the patient may get affected because of the lack of privacy. Now we come to this telemedicine practice guidelines. So many people are boasting that in pandemic period, telemedicine has been used extensively. However, we don't understand that telemedicine was used by doctors because to protect themselves from COVID patients. It was not to give service to the patient, it was for to protect them. And now if any legal issues affect the uh, you know, consultancy or this telemedicine practice, then immediately doctors will stop using. So we have to do all possible things to protect data and protect doctors from legal issues so that telemedicine and data connectivity are used properly. Now is telehealth legal? So as per the paragraph 54 of Martin Dissler judgment, telemedicine is not legal in view of the Supreme Court. Okay, teleconsultation is not legal. Now IMA has opposed telemedicine, IMA has opposed, opposed NDHM. There are concerns with doctors. Now telemedicine practice guidelines have tried to legalize it. <laughs> but while legalizing it, there are many errors which are introduced in legalizing. The most glaring error is about the consent. The consent as per TPG is that if patient initiates consultation, consent is implied. I am sorry. To my mind, it is incorrect. Consent is implied only when patient comes to my clinic and takes consultation from me. Patient does not know what all is involved in teleconsultation with respect to data privacy and data security. So his consent is not implied for teleconsultation. There are inconsistencies and inaccuracies in the process of teleconsultation about which patient should be told explicitly. He should be told that even though the software company takes utmost care for securing the data, there can be security protocols which can fail as accidentally or by uh, you know mechanics of somebody else. And those security protocols, if they fail, they should not be able to hold doctors responsible for the data breach. If you have seen the DISHA Act, which has now lapsed, it was giving 5 lakh rupees penalty and 5 years imprisonment for doctors. Now, we oppose tooth and nail because it is incorrect, because doctors are not trained to protect data in any which way. They are trained to treat patients, and it is not on the doctors to protect data. Now, if you see the nature of telemedicine, the, uh, the physical examination is not possible. So the doctor is going to get insufficient information there is poor quality of voice, poor quality of resolution of image, poor quality of color of image, and lack of understanding on both sides, which are likely to introduce errors. Now, who protects doctors from those errors? It will be only the consent which is taken from the patient for every e consultation that will protect the doctor. So we have to have a consent which is multilingual, and we have to release the doctor from all these responsibilities, not only doctor from the the entire hospital administration which is involved in uh, providing this telehealth should be released from the uh, uh, data breaches and the uh, problems in the data uh, consistency. So there are certain limitations of telemedicine which needs to be uh, you know, handled. Now about number of consents. What I personally feel is for every telemedicine consultation there should be consent. But for physical examination, there should be only once consent taken from the patient when he gets his uh, in national digital health ID. Okay, when he takes his ID of digital health ID, he is should be deemed to have given consent for all doctors who are going to treat him thereafter. For every encounter, for every teleconsultation, if he is to be give, giving consent, now whether that consent is to be electronic or paper consent is not clear anywhere. If I keep on piling papers in the hospital for giving consent for every encounter, my entire storage will fill with only consent forms. And the electronic consent will be in the hands of the people who are handling data, which can be misused or which can be manipulated. 
so that consent has to be very uh, clearly thought of and second issue is about cancellation of consent now suppose i have treated a patient and there is cancel consent given to me should i be able to access data to the point of last encounter in which i have treated okay i don't mind if the consent is uh, blocked to me for data after that suppose i messed up something suppose i have done something wrong okay someone else has corrected but at least i should be able to protect my interest till the time i have given the patient treatment so that uh, care has to be taken while cancellation of the treatment and most important is responsibility of protecting the data cannot be taken and should not be given by the doctors who are not trained to handle this responsibility so what i personally feel is that doctor should be called as data collectors and not data fiduciary data fiduciary should be the software company software vendor network managers data managers all those people are working behind the scene and who have power to manipulate the data who have power to sell the data it is not the doctor he is ethically bound not to disclose also so these are my concerns about uh, data privacy and data security thank you very much over to you well, thank you very much uh, uh, dr rajiv joshi i think uh, the consent for you is very important and data privacy uh, who is responsible and who will be able to protect it uh i think we'll know a little more i would like to invite uh, mayank agarwal now uh, to the stage uh, he is the founder of we clinic a mobile phone based telemedicine solution for doctors and a technology entrepreneur with over 12 years of experience and he has filed patents for uh, authored and authored research papers in diverse technologies he has built a telemedicine platform that have served over uh, 1 million consultations your rich experience would be of great value to us over to you mind thanks a lot dr sundara uh, firstly uh, i would like to thank uh, all the people who just talked before me they've uh, really talked about a lot of the things and they've laid out a lot of the issues in a very clear manner so uh, instead of repeating what they're saying uh, i just uh, want to uh, bring uh, an implementer or a it person's perspective on this right uh, first and foremost absolutely security and privacy are the two primary concerns in any data system that is built it does not necessarily have to be a medical system right uh, what happens with medical systems is that the stakes are significantly higher because we are talking about life and death we are talking about a lot uh, more that can go wrong if the data goes into the wrong hands now uh, i am somebody who strongly believes that the offline experience and the online experience for the physicians should be as close to possible uh, as close uh, as similar as possible right so if a doc the way a doctor conducts his practice in an offline environment it is the responsibility of the solutions providers to make sure that it translates as far as possible on a one on one basis in a online environment now uh, when we are talking about taking consent when we are talking about the examination what is possible what is not possible of course telemedicine is a limited platform right and when you look at the telemedicine practice guidelines they lay it out very clearly they these are the things that you can do these are the things you cannot do uh, the doctors are the best people who can judge at to what extent they can help the patient through uh, telemedicine right uh, so all of that is laid out nicely doctors are the primary people who take those decisions there it is the responsibility of the software to not add on burdens onto them so we as it people need to make sure that the consent is taken in a similar manner it is as comprehensive as it needs to be uh, the experience for the patients and the doctors is as similar as it can be uh, uh, to an offline consultation that does not happen today and uh, there are i would say two primary reasons for it one is that when we look at uh, some of these great uh, documents that have been made you know the ehr standards 2013 2016 you look at hipaa you look at uh, various other standards around the world it turns out they seem to be onerous right uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it implementers tend to find ways around implementing them right so uh, if you bring out ehr standards we'll start calling them 
OHRs or one health record. If you bring out some other standards, we'll start calling them something else because one, these standards are notoriously incomprehensible for a lot of the people. And uh, second, even the doctors don't see a lot of value in a lot of these things. Right. And that goes to my second point, which is commercial considerations. And it turns out these commercial considerations really rule the roost today. Uh, doctors don't want to pay for software. So the software implementers are incentivized to not make good software. Right. Uh, they don't want to put in anything more that is absolutely essential, which will allow them to sell. They only care about selling the software, but doctors don't want to pay. Now, these uh, so IT implementers need to find various different ways to make money. After all, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to make these softwares in the first place, right? And that money has to come from somewhere. Nobody's doing charity. So they then say, okay, it's a data play. Let's try to farm that data and do something with it. Now, a lot of people will tell you that, uh, medical data is invaluable and so on. And, uh, you know, I respect Dr. Suraj uh, mentioning how uh, he was able to talk about the dengue cases and uh, he was able to uh, help doctors and uh, understand what's happening. But in general, I, ha I do not know too many people who have made vast amount of money by analyzing medical data. Right? Maybe that pot at the end of that rainbow, that pot of gold is not there. We just think it's there. So it's something that we have to really assess as a society as to whether we, if we really want really high quality software, we want to make sure that the IT implementers, etc., do not have any other motive except to make sure that the doctor does his job better than uh, he could otherwise. Then the doctor will need to think about how he can incentivize the IT guy to, uh, to do the right thing. Right. On our side, you know, Absolutely. We skimp like crazy <laughs> and we should not be doing it. So yeah, that's, that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you. There are some uh, very honest, uh, uh, you know, comments from you, uh, Mayank. Thank you very much for that, for that speech, but commerce is what will drive telemedicine platforms and that's the incentive for them to go around. Uh, I will now invite uh, Mr. Sujit Katyar. Uh, an entrepreneur and health IT professional with 20 years of experience um, in digital healthcare, in telehealth and telemedicine, uh, and uh, in med legal and e learning and CSR, very sound working knowledge of the web and mobile technologies and cybersecurity. Uh, welcome, uh, uh, Mr. Sujit. Uh, the mic is with you. Uh, thank you, Sundar, sir. Thank you for a uh, nice introduction. Uh, first, I would like to start with uh, what Dr. Suraj said, uh, data deletion. Data cannot be deleted. Okay, many a times I have recovered data from the formatted hard drive. Okay, and very easily you can Google and you can download the uh, uh, utility and it's, it's done. Okay, and uh, yeah, about uh, what Mr. Mayank said, uh, doctors or hospitals they don't want to pay okay it's been uh, my experience uh, it's been around 20 years for me here and i have been trying to like uh, organize uh, this unorganized market okay because uh, if entry level barriers are low then if we are uh, designing something up service based where we can charge some 100 200 rupees per user per month but no i'm sorry i tried 10 years back with my venture and it didn't work. Okay, so, and things are changing. Like uh, digital healthcare, uh, here it, 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 it since long. Okay, but recently many terms like telemedicine, telehealth, remote monitoring, wearables and AI, ML, blockchain, NLP, sensors, so many, so many things are here. Okay, and uh, those are uh, being used. So, blessing in disguise, digital healthcare, is an opportunity emerging from the crisis. Okay, major reason might be the pandemic, but uh, there was good availability of uh, reasonably good and affordable internet speed and availability of smart devices to common men that also helped in a big way. Okay, uh, now 
if we compare like okay people earlier used to say that indians don't buy anything until unless they do uh, they are not feeling it they are not touching it but with the success of e-commerce i think it's it's wrong okay we can buy provided there is a good confidence level is there adaptability will be there and similarly i can compare it with the healthcare also okay uh, uh, it's been like okay in uh, if we say uh, the other sectors like fintech edtech e-commerce adaptability has been phenomenal fantastic okay but uh, yeah slowly gradually because of pandemic here also we are listening many things uh, like five crore uh, consultation recent report uh, uh, was mentioning uh, by practo and uh, then go government platform like e sanjeevni they completed more than 3 lakhs consultation so adoption has been good excellent phenomenal but uh, reason everybody knows so post covid to become uh, this thing normal it's everybody's responsibility it cannot be like uh, everything should be taken care by uh, the uh, uh, the technology persons the doctors we in combine everybody should make sure that uh, it should continue in the future as well okay uh, when we talk about data security and privacy uh, there is a huge range okay security against whom okay it can range from the people working with you till cyber criminals till china as i i'm sure next uh, war will be more related with the cyber things and next target will be the health uh, information the uh, health facilities because the more the dependency more problem can arise okay so that's how it's it's uh, 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 the authorities should make sure that uh, it should not happen because uh, the cyber criminals uh, look it at a very quick and big money is there so like recently i was going through one report from the us which was suggesting that one uh, this uh, uh, health record is being sold in gray market for 10 dollar which is many a times than the normal uh, uh, credit card information okay so now coming the uh, this data analysis part so is the this this systems are just for storage and retrieval of the data you do some new patient and some entry of information and the retrieve of course we need to analyze the data so that we should be more proactive than reactive okay so but again when we talk about the data analysis the one thing comes immediately in mind is facebook cambridge analytica data scandal but is that the end of the road technology is just for storage we need to find these things though Uh, uh recently again i was going through something like using only jeep date of birth and gender in us 87% of exact records can be found but we need to address these issues in a possible way but, uh, and but data analysis has to be there because the way uh, dr suez said until unless like uh, artificial intelligence how it's going to work it's not going to be the same old decision support system kind of thing which if with a fixed algorithm okay you if you really want uh, the benefit of artificial intelligence then data access has to be there we need to have access of the bigger size of the data so that's how we can uh, easily do the early detec uh, detection of disease in any individual or in the group or anything so that's how uh, even uh, slowly some uh, perception is being created like uh, this uh, ndhm will be used by insurance companies pharma companies we need to prove this thing wrong in whatever way possible uh, we need to give everybody the the all the participant um, this healthcare ecosystem the enough confidence uh, so that this these things should continue okay as far as this uh, uh, 
the uh, recent changes in this thing uh, uh, from the privacy uh, this uh, uh, guidelines by uh, authorities uh, for the uh, digital health uh, this um, online practice and uh, many more other things so it's it's good it's just a start which has to be there there are many issues many problems that we know but somewhere something start has to be there okay so now i want to uh, touch upon one thing which is missing i think uh, uh, till now uh, that is related with the design okay so design that everybody can do for the data security and other things we can rely on the uh, storage of the data on server encryption and so many things but uh, uh, like when we are de uh, de uh, designing the process in any any organization or uh, while designing the software uh, there are few uh, concepts which uh, i would like to discuss in sh in short uh, our approach should be proactive not reactive prevention has to be there not the remedy privacy by design comes before the fact not after okay privacy as the default setting what has to be by default default has to be like we need to secure the privacy by default it's not open because in many cases you go for facebook and other other even popular apps by default settings has to be improved okay so privacy by design is embedded into the design and architecture of the it system okay privacy by design seeks to be accommodate all the uh, uh, interest and objectives in the positive sum which should be win win manner not zero sum manner and it should be end to end security full life uh, uh, cycle protection has to be there uh, it has to be visible and uh, transparent privacy by design seeks to assure all stakeholders that whatever the business practice or technology involved it is in fact operating according to the standard promises and objectives so government authorities are doing their bit now it's our duty our thing to like inform them with the feedback and what should be there and uh, i would like to close with the thing because uh, i have been associated with iml which has been the foremost authority in mid, mid legal since more than a decade or so and i am pretty confident that iml will again play wider role in better adoption of digital healthcare to all stakeholders of medical community that's all from my side thank you Uh, thank you, Sujit, for those wonderful comments. Uh, so you're saying the adoption is going up. E Sanjeevni, uh, the government telemedicine app, is seeing a lot of consultations, uh, and it is reaching record heights every day. Uh, but analytics is important. That is how we will come to know about. Uh, we will be able to predict uh, further diseases uh, and be able to stop them. But you think that the design of the software by itself has to be improved now. many questions have been raised let's slowly move uh, to the legal uh, side of it i would like to invite aniket rani um, a legal professional with over 12 years of uh, experience and an in-house counsel to different uh, domestic and international corporates he specializes in legal issues uh, in data protection and data privacy and has published many articles on the subject the uh, aniket uh, welcome the mic is yours uh thanks uh, sundar ji thanks a lot for this uh, uh thanks a lot for arranging this session uh, uh it's it's it was like a key thing to your uh, uh the panelist and uh, they have kind of rightly uh, uh raised up their uh, their point of view on the issue uh while i would just like to limit myself in uh, in uh, on on a legal front as to how the guidelines that have been issued kind of fall short on the key parameters which otherwise are expected uh, to be addressed over a period of time uh, we have to first understand is uh, a key thing is that uh, right to privacy has been defined as a fundamental right uh, in india uh, and thanks a lot to the recent uh, judgment of the supreme court in uh, potasomic ways where uh, a majority bench decided that yes it is a fundamental right now on that front uh, when we uh, try to see this guidelines i think the perspective bit changes and it becomes more in terms of uh, how a data uh, subjects rights have to be analyzed and perceived 
especially when a patient is perceived as a data subject or a beneficiary of that entire rights and the uh, regime of rights that we are talking all about uh, the uh, the uh, when when we see the global standards um, especially when i see it from uh, from the global standard perspective uh, i see gdpr which is the key uh, driving force of the privacy regime globally uh, we have seen it getting implemented uh, four years back whereas the environment to get it implemented all it began from 1998 onwards in eu zone and when i see this uh, the gdpr as a bible of the privacy and the fundamental rights related to privacy there are seven key principles on which a right of a data subject has to be considered or analyzed and these are the kind of global benchmarks i mean we are not talking something that you know is something that is you know we wanted but it does these are the global benchmarks and when we follow them as a global global benchmarks on the issue of privacy data protection personal data protection these are the things that should be considered one is the purpose limitation does this guideline addresses that in my view yes it to some extent addresses the purpose limitation in terms of how the data or the personal data uh, uh, which is getting generated will be has to be used and i i i think the guidelines are not kind of you know not falling short on that they kind of uh, cast responsibility on the participants especially the rm uh, the the medical practitioners to how 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 best he should use the data and anyways he subject to the professional code of conduct of his profession the second key principle is all about data minimization yes in my view it does kind of addresses to some extent to the extent relevant uh, the data has to be obtained from the patient uh, i'm not going to the uh, into, into the area uh, into the area of uh, uh, consent being sought or not being sought how valid that consent is how constructive that consent is how comprehensive the construct uh, the consent is that are a separate areas which 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 need to be uh, which need to be kind of addressed on a separate front but yes on data minimization yes it kind of cast responsibility on the doctor to to kind of limit the usage of the uh, to limit the usage of the data to the extent it is relevant and required for diagnosing the particular uh, ailment of a patient that is uh, approaching uh, him or her through telemedicine or tele health services third key principle is about accuracy now uh, i have my own doubts as to how accuracy can be checked uh, on this on this entire uh, uh, on this entire episode now while the guidelines are very clear as to you know the uh, the doctor doesn't uh, stay is responsible for the accuracy because it's it's like i mean he i mean the guidelines are kind of you know have kind of addressed this uh, in a very short way but it actually doesn't make do the doctor responsible and i'm completely on for it uh, we cannot make a doctor scapegoat for kind of verifying the accuracy of the data that is being shared across the platform uh, but it kind of addresses uh, that he at least doctor is not responsible but i am pretty doubtful as to what are the channels and the ways of determining the accuracy of a data that is being shared across on a uh, on a online mode the fourth key principle is about uh, integrity and confidentiality which in my view is also being addressed to some extent which is uh, casting a responsibility on the doctor as to the data that has been given or that has been addressed uh, accessed by the doctor uh, through this uh, telemedicine tele healthcare and uh, tele healthcare uh, mode has to be treated confidential the fifth key principle is uh, lawfulness fairness and the transparency around the process now this is something which i see the guidelines are falling short of uh especially because there is no transparency on the area of how the i mean uh, how the data is going to be stored in what mode it has to be stored in backups uh, who all are the other participants the invisible participants who are going to access or have the potential to access this data there is no transparency around it i think this is one area wherein uh, uh, wherein uh, the the guidelines should kind of take a initiative and define the key roles of the key participants uh, as to uh, who the data to whom the data is going to go where the data backup is going to happen so i think that is one area wherein the 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 kind of guidelines are falling short of uh, the other two key areas wherein the the guidelines kind of fall short of is uh, the the storage the backup requirements 
how the data backup is going to happen, for what period data backup is going to be there, with whom the data backup is going to happen, and the last key principle on which the uh, on which the uh, uh, the guidelines are falling short of are the accountability. Now, I think you know it's more important that in this entire process, uh, the key visible participants are data subjects and the uh, doctor and his team who is participating in the exercise. But in my view, these are not the the kind of you know. Uh, uh, the most, uh, you know, damage causing participants. I mean, the greatest damage causing causing participants are the ones who are not defined in the guidelines. And these are the technological platforms. Uh, one of the panelists uh, did kind of acknowledge the key role that these platforms or these kind of participants are playing. And the uh, concern that he raised is very valid. In my view, the technological platforms are the key drivers of this entire exercise. We have to acknowledge one thing is that a lot amount of data is getting generated, which otherwise was not getting generated. I see a great business opportunity for a data in this case, but that's a commercial point. Okay, but from a legal standpoint, the data that is getting generated has is getting a tangible presence from a legal standpoint. And this data is is like a is like an asset. And uh, who controls this asset is one thing, but who is accountable for that asset in terms of usage, the end usage is something not very clear. The guidelines uh, do kind of make a reference to the existing laws of India. Uh, and, and as on day, we am very honest that they are very split and they are not uh, under one roof. Uh, like the one of the reference that is meant, made, uh, mentioned in the guidelines is about the IT security reasonable standards uh, rules under the IT uh, law of India, the uh, Information Technology Law 2000 of India. Uh, well, it's a good reference point uh, for someone to be aware as to these are the rules that are applicable in terms of the, uh, the, the healthcare data that is getting generated. But to be very honest, these are 2011 rules. Uh, I have not seen a lot of further customization or further you know, um, uh, fine tuning happening to those rules. And mind it, I mean, those rules were created in 2011, much before even the, I mean, even the, before the GDPR got implemented, which, which I see as a global standards. These rules basically were meant for uh, corporates, corporates who were actually dealing in a lot of sensitive personal data. One of which is defined into that rules is the healthcare data, I agree with it. But these are kind of high level rules, standards for India, uh, wherein uh, the corporates were made responsible in terms of certain obligations in terms of uh, handling the sensitive personal data. But uh, when I have to actually kind of uh, align or kind of compare these uh, 2011 securities, I mean the IT uh, reasonable security standard rules against the uh, global standards, there are many areas which it, the, the, the rules are incomplete. For example, like uh, while the rules kind of uh, make it clear that there has to be uh, uh, audit that has to be practiced by the uh, by the data controller who is actually uh, possessing the data, but the rules doesn't kind of lay down any clear mandate as to who is the nodal authority that is going to kind of you know uh, exercise that audit or that is going to kind of oversee that audit. Uh, there is no compulsory audit requirements that have been, you know, uh, built into the, those rules. Uh, there is no clear, you know, mandate as to uh, where the data has to be stored. It actually says, you know, the data can be transferred to any other country, but are those countries being kind of being made clear as to which countries are these are to which countries this data cannot be backed up or transferred to in my view they shouldn't be backed up or transferred to these any other countries this, this data should actually originally stay in India the way uh, the rules when these apply to banking industry it's very clear that uh, the financial data the uh, which is generated in India by the Indian banks while it can be transferred to an offshore destination but a copy of those uh, data has to be maintained by in the by an Indian entity managing that data. So there, there's a bit of clarity in those fronts, but not that clarity in, in terms of uh, our healthcare industry. Now, uh, so, so I think I, when I see these uh, lacunas, it kind of creates a bit of a concern in my mind uh, when I want to evaluate these rules and to see as to 
who is the data controller in these rules who is the data processor in these rules who is the data subject obviously it's it's me as a patient with data subject but in absence of that clarity you know when i want to kind of see these rules and want to kind of opt for the telehealth and telemedicine services i you know if i am an intellectual if i am a kind of literate data subject or literate uh, data patient i mean a data patient then i think i i would be I, i see a lot of concern and i don't have the confidence of opting for the services uh largely you know when i uh, i mean largely you know we have to understand that you know the 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 Uh, technological platforms that we are talking about in this uh, in this entire episode uh, as on day uh, these technological platforms are kind of independent operators uh, most of these are foreign operators and they are uh, policies uh, are independently managed by their own uh, home country associations it's not that they are based out in india and there is an indian uh, mandate to which they are subject to so assuming a scenario when there is a data breach uh, there is a loss of data of a patient or a group of patients uh, who have opted to uh, opt for the telemedical and tele uh, telehealth services what is the scenario i mean is uh, are these technological platforms i'm not talking about those that are in india but those which are you know foreign uh, uh, they stand on uh, technological platforms are these answerable to the uh breaches that are being caused is there a responsibility cast on them that in case of a data breach they have to notify and compulsory notify uh the data subjects about the breach which is which is which is otherwise a requirement in other uh, uh global legislations like gdpr i don't see that so a jurisdiction versus responsibility is something i see a major challenge i don't see uh, uh, any any uh, possible scenario as on day that there is an audit or a government control that uh, can be you know can, can be exercised by the government of india on to these technological platforms and i am talking about those that are not india based technological platforms so uh, so i think that's a gap i see when i when i see uh, when i want to kind of you know opine on this uh, technological platform being a participant of this entire ecosystem and uh, Uh, uh so that's a gap which i think needs to be filled up uh, somehow and uh, needs to be addressed while uh, while i make this mention i also need to be very honest to uh, to all that the data protection um, bill which is uh, in the offing uh, does have all of these kind of concerns being addressed because it is largely being based on the uh, gdpr and some of the best legislations of the globe uh, globally on data protection data privacy but it is yet to see the you know Uh, the the life i mean it is not it has yet to become an act but until that day uh, these guidelines are just kind of haywire i mean in terms of certain issues that i just highlighted so some of the key suggestions that i would like to uh, uh, give to the, the to to this uh, respected forum is uh, while all these things are not in our control uh, and they gradually would be under our control uh, in the best possible way but i think a lot of investment needs to be done uh intellectual as well as financial in terms of training the participants i mean what i mean to say training the participants is that uh making data subjects aware of their rights as well as the uh, uh, the medical fraternity aware of their responsibilities and while we do that we are not creating an environment that you know that data subject of the patient is the only beneficiary of this entire episode and the doctor is the scapegoat of it it's not like that but Uh, we are kind of sensitizing the participants uh, in terms of uh, what are the best practices that should they should opt for and which otherwise under the guidelines there is a requirement that the trainings have to be conducted so i would expect uh, uh, iml to kind of uh, invest and kind of create some modules around it and uh, to to basically you know um, train the necessary you know participants uh, 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 in a rightful way the second key thing that i would like and the government take into consideration is that while the law of india in terms of data protection personal data protection is yet to happen and an act of the day but i think the they should try to align this uh, guidelines to the core best principles that are globally followed for data protection data security so i think there is nothing that stops from them from doing it and those are very clear uh, guidelines i mean those are, those are clear, very much clear requirements globally so i think that needs to be addressed in these guidelines uh, in the best possible way keeping commercial concerns in mind as well and finally i think there has to be a larger incentive for people to kind of opt for this 
telemedicine and telehealth care you know services because we cannot deny the fact that convenience is something that is drives the industry and we have to adopt and adapt to it because uh, it's a need of the art so saying that sorry there is a lot of concern in that telemedicine or uh, uh, services uh, let's not discourage in that way but let's have a lot of incentive uh in kind of promoting this kind of services uh, and at the same time kind of giving the confidence that yes the necessary key things in in in, in relation to data privacy data protection have been well taken care of so i think that's how the environment and the ecosystem needs to be built up gradually over a period of time in my view thank you anikit very very uh, uh, nicely put i think you've raised several uh, key issues there uh this is another time that we are hearing about the need for awareness uh of data privacy among various actors in in this case uh you also said that the guidelines are currently falling short there is something in the offing which the government has uh, been trying to bring about but we do not know when that will become applicable and hopefully it solves some of addresses some of these issues but i think the key point that you were trying to raise is the lack of a framework that can be applied to this country immediately and i think to find answers let us now uh, go to dr suman bhattacharya where i think he will be able to help us with a lot of these answers that are coming to he is a, a medical graduate from medical college bengal and a healthcare information expert informatics expert with more than 33 years of experience uh, his special areas of interest include telehealth uh, ehr standards clinical data analytics and application of predictive analytics in uh, treatment planning dr bhattacharya over to you thank you very much so i would like to uh, address a few of the points that were raised by the previous speakers so let me start off with some definitions uh let's see what is i'm sure the uh, the legal luminaries that are present in this panel are aware of, aware of all this but uh, just to keep uh, it into perspective a disclosure is defined as any message about self that one communicates to another this is by cosby in 1973 privacy is the claim of individuals or groups or institutions to determine for themselves when how and to what extent information about them is communicated to others this is from westin in 1970 and security is method and technique to protect privacy so this is from hong et al in 2004 and it is basically a defense mechanism from any attack so security actually is the technical aspect it is very technology heavy consent must be taken explicitly and not implied i agree with dr joshi uh, and it should be done at the level of the applications uh, and the data collectors and uh, his point on data collectors and fiduciaries also i completely agree change management is definitely a key consideration in the entire paper to electronic transformation process without change management i do not see anyway telehealth becoming uh, a mainstream uh, and the uh, and the and the evidence for this goes into the adoption of his hospital information systems which uh, has uh, proven to be really really difficult and the clinicians have run away from it it's only the up to the nursing level yeah and that to the poor souls have been forced to use it uh, although uh, n number of training sessions are conducted but uh, still uh, there is always a challenge and to a large extent is because the systems themselves are not very uh, simple let's put it like that solutions need to be properly designed and implemented this is exactly my next point so until and unless that is done no matter how hard you try it is actually very illustrative i remember in 1996 um i first came to know of yahoo and yahoo was the dominant search engine and you did anything and you had to run to yahoo to search 
and when google came within no time yahoo was history now there is a very interesting reason why this happened i don't know how many of us uh, in the panel are uh, have ever used yahoo search engines it was not easy it you needed to put in for wild cards you needed to put in a star and then you needed needed to put in a concatenation between words like a plus and if you wanted to exclude you needed to put in a minus and all sorts of very funny things you needed to do and then there was another called advanced search where you went and you you put in a lot of stuff into various fields and then you said search and it might or it might not find out but when you did it in google it was just one box you entered whatever you wanted to enter and the google engine was smart enough to figure it all out because they used natural process natural language processing and it was universal and they even went further i mean you can not only search within that box but you can even do calculations so you can just put in your in any uh, formula and it would uh, with numbers of course and it will give you the result the reason is of course larry the the the, the uh, i think his name is larry page he was not uh, he, he didn't know html programming so what he did was that was the maximum he could do that little bit of one box and uh, that seemed to be the killer and they i don't know whether they still have such a position but there used to be a vp position in the company whose job was it to ensure that that particular search screen remained as simple as it was possible so uh, designing systems if i look at many of the emr ehr solutions there are boxes all over the place very busy screens and believe me that's the last thing as a clinician you need to look at the same case would be for any record keeping which is clinical so solutions need to be properly designed and implemented i agree uh, there was the, yesterday i heard this so this point is already been made that instead of delete what you need to do is to archive and you have to flag that particular record that this has been archived so that it doesn't show up but it is not deleted it is not removed uh, please note that if a person says i want that my data to be deleted it's gone forever so later on if the person changes his or her mind you cannot retrieve it back also many of the data are part of clinical notes made by a clinician during the course of treatment of a patient they are his own personal notes for his reference now you cannot possibly ask them to delete their notes simply because they have taken the option of keeping it as an electronic in an electronic format so there are challenges so the nice work around is to archive it so that keeps it all very safe and sound then there is a there is no point of storing a record unless it is reused i mean you cannot have a store and forward it needs to be reused in some method and which is where analytics comes into play if you are not analyzing your uh, the data you are actually basically doing a disservice now clinical data is actually big data it fulfills all aspects of big data which are four v's some people say five v's but normally it is four v's of volume velocity variability and veracity so i don't want to get into the technical details of it but how do you use the data for your analytics you have to anonymize and you have to code the data so in anonymization you strip all personally identify the phi the uh, personally identifiable bits of data like the name the and uh, ip address and uh, mobile the, uh, any any phone numbers the address and there are other there are about 13 items which are there which needs to be removed but once an anonymization is done you cannot retrieve it back so there is another process called deidentification which is where you can still go back to the original record but anonymization technically uh, you are not supposed to be able to get back to the original uh, one but yes there have been now uh, and this has already been mentioned during this meeting 
that uh, it is possible to retrieve or you know make a perfect match as long as you have the age and the gender of the person um, although uh, it is possible to do that however here the importance of coded data comes into play uh, although you if you have the entire data as code and you are matching it with another code you should be able to at least theoretically get it back but anonymization process ensures that all free text data is removed so if it is not coded it cannot be analyzed and ehs standards talks about uh, the uh, what codes that needs to be used and one of the best codes is nomad city for clinical um, information clinical data telehealth is ideal for remote monitoring and care anybody using it for the first contact unless of course it is something that you just you know in the middle of the night somebody calls you up saying doc i have this problem uh, what should i do so uh, just to tide over for the moment till the person is able to come and physically visit you you can use telemedicine telehealth but uh, anybody thinking that telehealth can actually replace uh, the brick and mortar hospitals Uh, they are in cloud cuckoo land. It will not happen, at least not now. You never know. Star Trek, Trine, and you have some, you know, doing all sorts of tricorders and uh, all the uh, haptics and the rest of it. It is possible, probably, but it's still in the theoretical domain uh, and and uh, and uh, in research labs. It's not yet uh, in a practical uh, field. The efficacy and the safety has not been established. it will take it quite a quite some time not in our lifetime you see remember the and it is very well known that we doctors don't like to pay for the solutions the reason is of course we do not mind paying but the solutions must work and must make my life easier not more difficult more complicated than it already is i mean if i have uh, several patients waiting and i have to spend about 5 minutes trying to figure out what to write where and you know click here and uh, write there and all sorts of things it has to be intuitive and some process has to be found and if we find we are more than happy to pay the uh, corollary i draw is in ultrasound machine uh, i the reason why i use the word ultrasound is because uh many uh doctors would use ultrasound although there is this pcp ndt act which is a real uh killer for this but uh you can buy a, 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 a an ultrasound and you can use it and it gives you good information and you don't mind paying for it and the patient is also willing to pay for the uh, scan because the person sees the value so the value has to be there was must be value for money i mean nobody is willing to you know throw money about so we need to pay and we need to realize that we have to pay but we must insist that we have a solution which is workable which is makes our life easier and is able to deliver on its various promises it doesn't matter if the promise is low but as long as those are fulfilled because if you don't pay for a product we become the product and the vendors will then commercialize the product to their benefit so it is better to you know pay for it and not become a product oneself so simple solutions as i said are very are the best and the with the least busy uh, user interfaces and the users do not really care about the technology details and i have i have worked with many it companies and the common refrain is that i have used this technology and that technology now and then the entire thing becomes quite incomprehensible but as a as a end user you don't really care what you care is what you how you interact with the system and what benefit it gives you now coming to the telemedicine practice guidelines i did go through it and quite frankly i am not impressed by it um without uh, 
uh, getting into the legal aspects which, which i am not qualified at all to do to comment on i believe it is a non starter the reason is why is because it asks the users of telemedicine systems to undertake training and probably even pass a test or something so they must be certified that they are qualified to use telemedicine i do not see um, doctors uh, becoming extremely enthusiastic about this requirement and uh, that will not fly something has to be done and in my opinion that need what needs to be done is that the vendors should give a solution that helps the doctors comply with the provisions and not expect the doctor to you know be responsible for this or responsible for that the comments about disha is very well placed it was terrible uh, you cannot uh, have uh, the if the system is faulty but the doctor goes to jail and wherever the doctor is uh, maybe threatened with jail uh, you can be rest assured it will not be used and uh, to be honest if there have been uh, you know issues like like let's wait till the um, various uh, data protection act comes into play we need to see the provisions i would if i were to design a system i would presume the worst case scenario and application of the most stringent provisions currently known which are hipaa and gdpr and i was then sure it it has got even more it conforms to more than whatever that they are doing this would give me sufficient protection make it future proof against any other uh, provisions that might come into play these are the few of the points that i had to make i want, didn't want to make it too long i would be more than happy to uh, answer any questions that people might have thank you uh, thank you very much dr bhattacharya i think you you put it very nicely we need more simpler solutions rather than complex ones and more the penalty for using it doctors are definitely not going to uh, use something like that uh, softwares need to be better designed so compliance comes right in the beginning rather than being trained upon or being forced upon uh, people to do it very nice points there have been a lot of legal points that have come up in today's discussion as well aniket has uh, sort of uh you know try to answer that i would now like to invite advocate uh, mahendra kumar bachpai uh, advocate to the supreme court of india uh, and honorary director of the institute of medicine and law to throw a few aspects clear a few points from the legal perspective go to you mr bachpai uh thank you sundar sir may visible no close it thank you yes you are visible you can go ahead please okay. as far as uh, aniket is concerned here in uh, mumbai mumbai high court is known as an authority on uh, data privacy and obviously as i started my practice here in mumbai whenever i have some issues in privacy i look upon him and not only me other advocates also so uh, but there are some aspects uh, which he discussed today on which i don't agree with him back to differ some aspects that need clarification and i'll try to do that as a lawyer number 1 all the speakers who have addressed this consultation seem to be speaking only from one perspective when they when they are talking about telemedicine and that is the perspective of doctors coming on a platform or on an app please understand telemedicine practice guidelines is not only for platforms and apps 
it is there to regulate practice of medicine whether it is via video via audio via text and it could be one to one interaction doctors were hesitant using whatsapp using sms i presume sir someone spoke about uh, martin de souza case where honorable uh, justice markande karju said no physical consultation is a must no remote consultation as a lawyer of, from the constitutional courts i would be saying it was uh, merely an obiter or not even an obiter a casual observation it has no precedentry value but then it comes from the supreme court so if a doctor simply speaking with his patient on his mobile that would also be covered by these telemedicine practice guidelines it is not meant only for uh, apps and platforms let us do away with that wrong notion that is my first uh, this thing second yes let us come down to consent now if we are talking about consent in physical consultation there is no express consent needed it is implied both the parties voluntarily come across voluntarily come across each other the doctor is sitting in his clinic in his hospital he is ready to accept patients his acceptance is there the patient voluntarily walks inside pays the fees and he consults the doctor consent is there in physical consultations the written law in india is very clear and cutting off judgments from the highest courts they say a written informed consent is required only when there is an invasive procedure non routine invasive procedure nothing beyond that a surgery a procedure you must take a written consent very elaborate procedure you have to counsel the patient uh, tell him about the alternatives uh, prognosis uh, possible complications uh, take signatures witnesses god knows all what in telemedicine and when i am saying telemedicine right now it's telemedicine practice guidelines 2020 which is currently the written law on the subject statutory law made by a statutory body i don't see that as a guideline it is a statutory law we all have to follow it not following it there would be consequences so telemedicine practice guidelines as they stand today they say to before starting any telemedicine interaction patients consent for use or practice of telemedicine has to be taken and the guidelines are absolutely clear on that in fact they have illustrated in the guidelines a simple sentence from the uh, patient is all that is required let us not see india with spectacles of a us or a european country india is a very different country there are millions and millions who don't get primary health care thanks to e sanjeevani last time on the national consultation uh, their uh, uh, director was there and i was very happy to learn that yes 6 million 7 million consultations they have done great india needs that so number one as far as telemedicine is concerned the consent that is required is only to start telemedicine consultations or interaction that is all just yes, i am agreeable to that that is all and the guidelines are absolutely clear about that and for good reasons please read the purpose which are appended to these guidelines very clear doctor patient ratio is very low we all know that how will healthcare reach to the one who is on the lowest strata of the society telemedicine could be one equipment yes but when we come to data privacy and then again let us understand two aspects very clearly as a society 
as part of our culture data privacy is not known to us we are a family oriented society let us accept it many of these speakers are doctors and why doctors everyone knows that if today i have to undergo a surgery the decision will be taken by my family patients obviously come out i will uh, consult my family if it is an elective thing and i'll come back to you doctor my brother my sister married once even they will have a say my wife will have a say that is peculiarity of indian situation let us accept that not individualistic let us not copy paste whatever is happening abroad yes data privacy is required because there are third party players here it's not only doctor and patient there are commercial uh, elements which are there commercial considerations are there there are different variants let us accept that again i beg to differ with the uh, aniket on two aspects one he says that for the accuracy doctor is not responsible under the telemedicine practice guidelines sorry doctor has all the right to stop any telemedicine interaction if he is not comfortable if he is not satisfied with the data that has been collected the information that has been collected to evaluate the patient to enable him to manage the patient further he has got all the rights after charging fees he can say no you come in for a in uh, physical per, uh, consultation that right has been given in this telemedicine practice guidelines second aspect accountability yes accountability is there let us read the guidelines properly protection has been given to doctors to a very large extent that was required if we want doctors to come on telemedicine you can't force them that is what the telemedicine practice guidelines says in fact can the government of india or for that matter any statutory authority bring a law saying that all doctors must come on telemedicine no they can't so then there has to be some incentive and protection is there incentive is there the telemedicine practice guideline says that if data breach has happened because of a technical logical problem or because of a person other than the doctor the doctor will not be responsible at the same time responsibility has been cast if you are trying to use a service for telemedicine if you are trying to use a platform an app or any uh, uh, technological service you have to do due diligence you just can't say oh look i took it it was there and here is where my problem arises why should we burden the doctor with finding out whether this technological problem is proper not proper the avowed purpose of these telemedicine practice guidelines which we find in this guideline is that the poor doctor patient ratio so if you want doctors to use telemedicine to use telehealth first thing is you will have to protect them and there's nothing wrong if doctor so no this happens to be a risky thing i am not going to come on telemedicine law has given them a right and quite rightly given them that right it has given this right even to patients none of the parties can force each other to come on telemedicine first protection that is given so what is required then the suggestions what should be done going forward four issues which i think are required one a principal legislation is required overarching the problem again happens to be medical council of india cannot regulate a technological platform it's outside its purview they can merely regulate doctors and that they have done by bringing out telemedicine practice guidelines in fact most of the uh, uh, medical councils have brought their own telemedicine practice guidelines so an overarching legislation is required whether the patient uh, the uh, data protection bill 2019 will be able to do justice or not it remains to be seen or whether an other uh, uh, bill or another act 
is required by a competent authority, by a competent uh, ministry. Certainly MCI or the National Medical Commission, which has come into existence, does not happen to be that authority. Something like an IT Act 2000. Number two, doctors need protection. There must be some authority who, we, who must be there. And quite rightly, as someone said, that doctors only need to be data collectors, neither fiduciary nor beneficiary. Let us do away with that. Then doctors will come. Patients consent. What is the type of patients consent we need for data? Keeping in view our own socio uh, uh, economic cultural preferences of this country. Let us not ape the Western countries. And uh, So these are three, uh, we need to protect doctors, we need a uh, principal legislation and overarching uh, 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 legislation. And ownership of data in healthcare needs to be properly defined. Stakeholders should be named. And lastly, patient's consent is an issue. It must be clearly defined, described, responsibilities must be there, keeping in view the social, economic, and educational, cultural uh, aspects uh, of uh, the country. That's all. Thank you, uh, Sundar sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bajpai. Um, so an overarching legislation is required, a very well-defined IP Act is required. Doctors should not be burdened, but should be protected. Well, we have heard a lot from doctors. We have heard from IT experts, techpreneurs, even from lawyers. I think it is now time to bring Dr. Ratna Devi on. Uh, Dr. Ratna Devi, are you able to see me? Yes. So Dr. Ratna Devi is a representative from the patient side. While we have spoken all about from the IT side and the doctor side, what do the patients really want though? So Dr. Ratna Devi is the chair of International Alliance of Patients Organizations a charity uh, based out of UK. Uh, she is also the founder of the Indian Alliance of Patients Groups and the founder and board member of NCD Alliance in India. Welcome uh, to the panel, Dr. Ratna Devi, you have the mic. Thank you. And uh, I always say this, the patient should come first because whatever you discuss is uh, about the patient and for the patient. But unfortunately, in most panels, you see the patient coming last. Uh, having said that, I, I was listening quite attentively to what Advocate Bajpay was saying, and I think he has sort of uh, summed up some of the concerns that patients have, especially around consent. And, uh, you know, even in the one-to-one -one physical meetings, we see multiple consents being given. So with now a new, um, you know, a platform or protocol being described, uh, how does that concern consent redefine itself? And if a tele consultation is followed by a one-to-one -one meeting or followed up by further um, you know, investigations or other things, are we then asking for you know, a different version of a consent? And some of this I think has already been discussed. So there needs to be clarity on this because most often, uh, and it's not just most often, I think all of us would have experienced this that once we are a patient, uh, we are sort of at the uh, you know mercy of the hospital or the treating clinician, and because you are in a position uh, which is less powerful than the person who is giving you the consultation, you don't have much choice, and therefore, uh, you know whatever is done has to be done which puts the patient onto an equal platform where there is a trust as well as transparency in the way these things are uh, delivered. I think a lot has been said about the legal aspects of it, and uh, I will not go into that, except I'm not sure whether, uh, you know, um, enrolling patients into beyond just the telehealth part of it has been discussed, because we do know that when patients consult, and if they have diseases that are not treatable, 
or um, you know uh, or options are available for medicines that are still under investigation then uh, you know you do enroll such patients uh, into trials and stuff like that and how will this shape up now with this telemedicine and telehealth platforms coming into place um, i'm not sure if there is um, you know clarity on those issues the uh, other issue that i wanted to flag is that um, you know and again advocate bashpe mentioned this that uh, telehealth is not about just treating and curing a condition but goes to wellness diet you know you know other issues around the healthcare of the person and when there is so much of um, gray areas if i can say that um, in in our country especially and uh, you know people having multiple systems of medicine as well how do you then you know bring this uh, data protection into place so to give an example if i am consulting a homeopath and, and uh, also a modern system of medicine and both are giving me different medications and there is no system where both uh, these data can be captured so that both the uh, you know uh, treating doctors are aware that there is something else that's also happening how do you then manage this kind of uh, you know uh, data also uh, you know we don't know at, at present whether ayurveda and other uh, alternate systems of medicines are practicing telemedicine and if they are whether these rules are applicable to them as well um the last uh, point that i wanted to raise and some of it has already been covered under the redressal mechanism or you know how do you uh, go to a person to, if you have a problem is about patient safety and we just celebrated the world patient safety day on 17th of september which talks of uh, you know issues beyond the seven or eight um, verticals that who talks about considering that there is a lot of home care happening now and uh, with this covid-19 that has now been uh, highlighted even more that people with long term chronic conditions are no longer reporting to hospitals but are trying to manage their conditions at home and uh, home care is therefore um, you know something that is coming into prominence and when you have home care you are also uh, giving a lot of services that are out of the purview of a hospital and an ehr system so our home care providers also under the purview of this tele telemedicine practice guidelines and if so how will it be implemented uh, what is the monitoring mechanism for these home health care uh, services uh, i also mentioned yesterday that many uh, insurance companies are now venturing into um, you know uh, wellness for example uh, yoga and uh, even diagnostic services and medicines so e prescriptions are being given by certain insurance companies and these are based on um, you know existing prescriptions so you don't need a new prescription from a doctor but you you just have to show them or give them an existing prescription and they send you your medicines so if if this is a case how do you then you know control that uh, and we know that in the context of our country uh prescription and dispensing are not uh, you know uh, monitored together the dispensing part of it is completely different from the prescription part so a doctor might prescribe uh, you know over a telehealth uh, or a teleconsult uh, you know uh, device and then the person goes on his own or on her own and buys the medicine or buys it from an e pharmacy and there's no way to join these two systems so yesterday i did also talk about continuum of care and whether we that can also be brought into these guidelines how do you then uh, ensure that from the patient's perspective it's not uh, you know we already have a fragmented system so it becomes even more fragmented with this telemedicine practice coming into uh, you know uh, existence so how do you protect the patient how do you make the patient's life more comfortable i know we talked a lot about the doctor's life becoming comfortable but how do you make the patient's life more comfortable how do you make it simpler and uh, easy to understand how do you make it uh, uh, you know more friendly user friendly so that patients are not navigating in unfamiliar languages 
and uh, uh, in la in uh, you know in the context of things that they don't understand so how do you break it down to something that is simple and not too technical and how do you limit uh, the confusion because patients are already very very confused so how do you limit that confusion and make it easy and also use this opportunity to build back the trust because we know that there has been a lot of erosion of trust and uh, now this is an opportunity to reach beyond cities to go back to the last mile and to reach people who have not uh, you know been able to take advantage of some of the higher institutions of care that are usually placed in metros and big cities so maybe telemedicine is that opportunity to reach the last mile and build back the trust that has been um, you know uh, eroded to a large extent um, that's uh, the few points that i wanted to bring forth to the audience from my side thank you thank you uh, very much dr ratna devi as usual always uh, smiling and bring forth the absolute right points patient safety is always there at the top of our mind but you raised some very important uh, uh, points is is home care part of these guidelines how are e prescriptions regulated uh, we need more patient friendly systems so that they are not confused and this is a great opportunity to to build trust very nicely uh, pointed out uh, we now completed our first round uh, but we have very little time left so i am going to go very quickly to each one of the participants and uh, you have about a minute or so to respond uh, dr shrinivas uturi you've been patiently listening through uh, all of this uh, your closing comments please i uh, know it's it's actually been very fascinating and i i love um the discussion that's happening um there's there's a lot of uh, talent on this panel and uh I think just you know offhand I I would just say that you know maybe um to to enable uh, more televisits uh, uh that you need to separate uh, the data breach that happens from EMR EHR perspective from what's actually what a televisit actually uh takes place so there's there's a difference between the two uh two things and maybe that's something that needs to be considered um you know and and then again i cannot um emphasize how uh telemedicine has um uh like expanded here in the US uh and rightfully because of the lack of resources in certain areas and and uh so it's again you know as much as possible not to make it prohibitive but make it an encouragement uh to be able to use this platform to get to the reach of the patients um and patients uh you know uh in the especially in the rural area so i'll 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 just end it off there but thank you so much for allowing me wonderful thank you so much do you see a great uh, uh benefit of telemedicine you think it will grow thank you so much uh dr ron sequera i think you missed out adding a few points in the first round so maybe just half a minute more please yes thank you so much i just have a, i first of all i just agree with exactly what dr bajpai said how was sorry advocate bajpai said few things i feel that will really help in the policy decision making for the future would be a very very comprehensive policy on cyber security because we will definitely be subject to a lot of hacking attempts because this data is available on the on the on the dark web so we have to have a very comprehensive data security cyber security framework in the legal legislation itself secondly is the policy and privacy i think the government also needs to make a very strong policy like they did with the credit cards where they required an otp for every credit card transaction that was a very strong method to prevent any misuse so i think a policy like that where a protection like uh, is done by the rbi and banks so because med- telemedicine is not like some food delivery app or some regular consumer app it is hardcore patient medical data which can and will be used against a patient in in case of a a, a a legal litigation third point is a medical record is also a medical legal record i have worked in the government sector in the private sector so we know that a medical document can be produced in a court of law as a medical legal record so deletion cannot be an option 
maybe the possibility would be there that you know the government or the policy would allow a patient to isolate the data from certain people whom he doesn't want to share because ultimately that's his prerogative that's his right but it cannot be deleted and has to be produced in the court of law or for insurance purposes so deletion is out of the question second point is what advocate bajpai really hit upon was the consent now there are two types of consents you have an implied or an expressed consent an expressed consent is not time limited but an implied consent is definitely time limited so that needs to be ascertained within the policy framework of this entire uh, you know this uh, framework what what we are looking to discuss with third access third, uh, the, the next point would be who does who has records and who has an access to them today you see patients on these uh, drug delivery apps you see people like pharmacy you see one mg you see all these other companies which are basically uh, dealing with uh, uh, pharmacies e pharmacies patients are sending them their private confidential information and we do not know who's at the other end who's reading the patient's prescription uh, and patients are sending them snapshots of their entire prescription with their drug history drug details whether they are hiv or whether they have cancer it's all being sent to a third party who is unknown to the patient there is of course it's an implied consent because patient is sending it himself but there needs to be a some sort of a protection to include the naivety of a patient because patient sometimes don't realize what they sure. do so that needs to be addressed into that thing and the policy should also include paraclinical like your nutrition physiotherapy like dr ratan devi said and others should also be included also when laboratories send emails or send send the reports to patients that should be included under telemedicine because it comes under that ambit the identified data will that be able to be used you know without identifying the doctor or the patient can that data be used for policy decision making can that be used for uh, you know uh, demographics can that be used that needs to be done and i think the drugs which are currently allowed under the telemedicine guideline is a very very small amount it's just making this entire telemedicine uh, concept a toothless tiger because we are completely limited in the number of drugs we are allowed to use the last point which i'll just mention is medical tourism and cross border consultations needs to be addressed this is very important because a lot of hospitals depend on a lot of international patients that has not been addressed in the telemedicine act i think that also needs to be included into this so i think you know what we really need is a platform which is extremely user friendly specialty specific with a high degree of individualization for each doctor's workflow this is absolutely essential to promote this adoption and at the same time maintain data privacy and total inoperability this would actually be the holy grail that's you know just a concise thing of what i wanted to share thank you very much you you summed it up very nicely uh, dr dhirwani one minute please sure uh, great great session no doubt i am really honored and uh, it's been a great enjoy to be and listen to all this i'm going to keep this really quick uh, one very important thing is like edtech or fintech health tech is a completely different ball game altogether we cannot do that but we can borrow learnings from there in keeping this streamlined keeping this secure if we could really have a framework that ensures all all ehr companies all uh, telemedicine companies all medicine delivery companies have to adhere to a same set of principles it would really help right now because of the way the competition is there are some um, e pharma companies uh, who are sponsored or who also have an ehr app along with them so there's a lot of things that are happening which uh, skews the market based on how much money you can burn and how big a pocket you have which is not really fair and uh, it's really it's really true from what i understand that the doctor the doctor in me and not the entrepreneur or the tech guy in me the doctor cannot be burdened with all this we need to give him a very clear cut simple solution that says boss this is a, as per guidelines you continue to use it you are secure end of the story you do what you do best that is diagnose talk to the patient examine prescribe you cannot be burdened with how private it is but now the tech guy he says that yes we need guidelines and we need better ehr apps that will take care of uh, these things and of course simplify it oh i can not even begin talking about ui and ux but i understand that's not the uh, uh, concern here but it's a disaster the one of the reasons we were loud is because we used the kiss principle we kept things simple like the google search example that was mentioned consent consent while iml has worked a lot on consent believe me it's a real gray area be it allopaths or homeopaths we are still not as updated or as in form as of now like i mentioned uh, security versus uh, simplicity is of use 
in the last three months or six months, doctors have gone to use WhatsApp as there is no tomorrow. And sure. uh, of course, we all know WhatsApp is not the most secure platform. There is right. no concept of consent. There is no concept of recording. There is nothing. It's just uh, okay. What? Okay, prescription sent, and that's really a disaster that we are doing today. So we need to talk more about this consent. This one line of the patient that okay, I consent for telemedicine. We really need to push that in a big way. I would put it that of of about two thousand odd doctors that I am in touch with, ninety percent of them would not be aware. of this so let's hope uh, we get a proper framework which is very similar what is being used in edtech fintech and we can all adhere to it will come out again with better apps and take things forward keeping things simple for the doctor and the patient their relationship should not be marred by what we do thank you so much completely noted dr rajiv joshi one minute please thank you for giving opportunity to talk <laughs> Uh, i would like to uh, say that dr baj professor uh, advocate bajpai said that consent is imply uh, explicit please refer to page number 17 of telemedicine practice guidelines which say that if the patient initiates telemedicine consultation the consent is implied and explicit consent is required if healthcare worker initiates the uh, cons uh, consultation so i uh, beg to differ with him on that point uh, Uh, Aniket said that uh, most of the telemedicine uh, practice guidelines uh, keep the responsibility of owner uh, responsibility on the doctors, whereas technological companies are not uh, given that much responsibility. Sujit has discussed about secret against who. Then Mayank said that commercial consultations are there. Uh, 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 the property of the patient is mentioned by uh, uh, Suraj. and lawsuits have been mentioned by uh, sequeria so i will just like to give a reference to my talk in sida conference where after a consultation of ima medical legal cell we had come up with a slide which said that uh, the data the patient uh, the doctors will take consent from the patients to take data on their servers but the consent will be not to send data to server of the government or the uh, state government or the central government because the misuse is likely to be at that place rather than the data in the hospital so if we don't protect doctors with respect to data privacy and data security i am will definitely push for that kind of consent rather than participating in the activity more uh, you know vigorously so we have to really think of protecting doctors i fully agree with uh, dr ratna that patient safety should be taken into consideration and how to make patients life easy is more concern and confusion in the patients should be reduced and trust should be built but i can tell you with my personal experiences that the government agencies which have been interacting in pcp and dt in ca applications have been harassing doctors so we doctors see that this could be a one more source of harassment and would definitely not like to get violence against us from the patients with respect to data privacy and also imprisonment and consequences thereof so we have to really have very strong laws to protect interests of the doctors who are not data fiduciaries we are collecting data and we are transferring it to the server that's the end of the story anybody who has power to control the data should be responsible thank you sure thank you thank you very much uh, um, mr mayank agarwal thank you sonar uh, so uh, first of all uh, i thank advocate bajpai for really clarifying a lot of things here uh, i think uh, when he says that these telemedicine practice guidelines are there for are not specific to ehr platforms etc he is absolutely right right and i think that's the reason why there is a certain burden of responsibility on the doctor to do due diligence now if he is if the doctor it's the doctor's prerogative to select whether he wants to use a ehr platform he wants to use a phone he wants to use whatsapp or whatever it's his prerogative if he is not using a certified or whatever ehr platform he must do a little bit of due diligence on it if on the other hand he does not want to take that headache he has every right to not take that headache by opting in for some sort of a platform which is willing to do that for him so let's just uh, you know uh, let's not say a doctor should not ever be responsible it depends on the tools the doctor chooses uh, dr uh, sikera said that we need to design for the naivety of the patient in all these scenarios absolutely 100% agreed i think a lot of the conversation that's happened today has been uh, well you know we understand and he understands and this will understands and that party understands but the patient doesn't understand it's true 
however it's we have to make the patient realize that education has to happen from our end so that he values his data doesn't go very nilly telling everybody what problems he has or doesn't have right so uh, i think that part of patient education has to be on us and uh, finally i just like to say i think overall uh, you know the government moves at a really slow pace but with the telemedicine practice guidelines with what they are in theory trying to do at least with the ndhm with the personal data protection bill that's come in most of the things that they are doing are headed in the right direction right it's not like uh, there are some red massive red herrings small red herrings are there of course things i disagree with of course right but in general things are going in a good direction uh, the fact that we are having this conversation is a good direction right so uh, you know i am very excited and i am very optimistic about how things are going forward thank you thank you uh, uh, very much mayank uh, uh, i see a fan following for uh, dr sequera and ratna devi here uh, next is uh, mr sujit uh, any comments from your side uh, i won't take long i am very hopeful that things will be good this decade is going uh, to be for digital healthcare and uh, yeah uh, this national health authority they are giving some sandbox kind of thing so all the technology people they should use it there is a process of like kind of verifying the platforms also if you are using the apis provided by them okay so that is the thing and one last thing uh, when fuzi and kodak were busy with the their quality films canon disrupted the market with the digital thing thank you thank you very much very nicely ended uh, mr aniket rani yeah sure thanks yeah so i might about the possibility of time uh, this uh, uh, three four key points uh, i would like to kind of uh, uh, give my as a lessons uh, 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 we have to acknowledge that there is a third pair of eyes that is monitoring this data getting exchanged over tele uh, through telemedicine and tele uh, health platforms uh, or through smooth so i think um, that has to be uh, identified what are the, th- the the third pair of eyes that is being you know monitoring and is ac- getting access to this data and more importantly into that uh, there is a lot of data profiling happening and i think this is something which is a concern for me so i think the immediate measures should be that there should be some check on the data profiling we all know that as per global uh, uh, in the global legislations data profiling is not permitted except for a very exceptional situations uh obviously not for commercial requirements but data profiling is something needs to be uh, immediately brought to rest if that is happening uh, the second key principle that i would like to highlight is uh, is that not any technological platform uh, needs to be allow, uh, needs to be kind of uh, uh, permitted to kind of uh, uh, participate or uh, marry in this party it is only of a list of certified technological platforms that needs or uh, that should be allowed to be opted for or should be allowed to participate in this, in this uh, telemedicine and telehealth uh, exercise uh, and this list has to be kind of uh, issued by uh, the government and uh, or a certified agency of the government so that you know we don't take, we don't cast the responsibility on the doctors to kind of exercise this discretion as to which is the best tele- uh, te- technological platform which is not and anyways which is not their job because they're not techn- te- uh, technological experts but it's the responsibility of uh, of, uh, of the government to list down the technological platforms sure. and third is that the um, uh, very soon the guidelines should come up with the list of uh, 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 requirements these technological platform should uh, be uh, you know coping up themselves with or should be prepared uh, prepared for you know so that you know uh there should be kind of a some kind of you know time given for this technological platforms who actually want to kind of participate in this exercise or uh, to prepare themselves for this uh, for this uh, uh, telehealth services okay. and uh, get themselves certified accordingly the 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 the, the issue of uh, the issue of um, uh, uh, standard contracting uh, or option of standard contracting should be uh, should be kind of opted by the government which which was basically there in uh, in gdpr as well okay. wherein uh, a participating tele uh, te- technological platform has to acknowledge a set of uh, uh, terms and conditions basis of which they can participate in in in, in uh, handling personal data and finally there has to be a nodal body there is no nodal body that is monitoring this entire episode there has to be a nodal body which is a, a combination of a medical legal and technical experts um, uh, under the central government or at the state level uh, however it may be 
So that, these are kind of four things that I thought of, you know, broadly mentioning it to the attention of the forum. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Aniket. Uh, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, any closing comments, please? Dr. Suman Bhattacharya, you are on mute. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I, I would just like to make the point that I reiterate, it is imperative to have information systems that are simple to use, safe and secure systems, and helps patients to be treated faster and hopefully cheaper, that ensures better outcomes. The time to begin was yesterday. We need to be ready. Currently, we are not. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very short, crisp. And to the point, uh, Advocate uh, Bajpai ji, any uh, closing remarks? No, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ratna Devi, any closing remarks from you, please? Thank you. I think this is a good beginning. Telemedicine is the way forward, uh, especially for a country as large, as diverse and as difficult as India. If we have to really manage the healthcare needs of such a large population, um, though the way we started telehealth was because of a pandemic, but I think it's a good beginning. Uh, what it needs to be done is strengthen further. And as many of the panelists said, have a strong nodal body that actually monitors and you know gives the opportunity to both the patients and the doctors for redressal if there is something that's not working well. And most importantly, you know, uh, protect the data, have transparency so that, you know, if something is going wrong, you know why it went wrong and you correct what went wrong, not you know fix the person who, who did the wrong. And um, maybe you know, as the scope of telemedicine becomes broader, we bring in more uh, specialties, more options into it, and then we build around that to make it stronger. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, need a, a process, uh, very important uh, for us. That's your point of emphasis. Uh, we are now at the end of the uh, the session, I will now invite kindly Justice uh, Ravi Tripathi ji to make his observations and uh, closing remarks as chair of the session. Over to you, Justice Tripathi ji. Uh, you're on mute. You may have to unmute yourself. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. It was really pleasant to hear all of you. Uh, friends, uh, I have a few things to add. Just wait, give me one minute. I'll, I'll put my... Sir, we are able to see and hear you clearly, sir. There is no problem at all. No, the difficulty is my, my battery is only 6% left. Oh, oh, oh. Can you just put it on charge and then I'll uh, start. Yes, sir. No, worry. no worries, sir. Please. It was really pleasant to hear all of you. Various aspects of the problem are brought out very succinctly. I have to start by saying that I, as a judge, will like to view everything on a different from a different angle. First thing, we were talking a lot about the consent. Now, I don't understand what do, what do you mean by here consent? Consent means whose consent and for what purpose? 
whenever there is a question of consent the question comes as to consent for what purpose no patient is going to give consent for misusing his data and for misusing the data in fact no consent will be effective also friends ये पॉट में कुछ गड़बड़ जो है एस मच एस टाइम इज लेफ्ट विद मी सो फ्रेंड दैट इज अबाउट द कंसेंट पार्ट एंड सेकंड वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग इज अबाउट इरोजन ऑफ ट्रस्ट एंड थर्ड थिंग इज that as uh, uh, advocate badpai was saying that we are trying to cut paste everything from the western world and trying to um, apply here in india all these three things are because as dr ratan devi rightly said there is lot of erosion of trust and that is why all these problems are coming up i can assure you one thing to all the doctor friends that if their bona fides are clear and if they are able to show those bona fides to the court no court is going to take any adverse or you know the the uh, you can say uh, hostile view against uh, against them that is the first basic assurance which i feel like you know extending from, on behalf of the judicial fraternity only that bona fides are supposed to be clear and if that is so then there is no difficulty about that second thing is normally the misuse of data it comes only uh, com comes only from the third party and for that there has to be a strict punitive uh, say provisions for the purpose of uh, penalizing the person who is misusing that particular thing nahi ho raha so uh, that is for the the difficulty comes friends very important aspect is about e and give me and by e sanjeevni you are able to see that yes you are able to see that we are uh, able to reach to the masses of this country very rightly advocate uh, badpe referred to that we have to be aware of and alive to the social economic and educational background of the people in this country the concept of privacy is again a superimposed concept on this particular society because if you remember the old tradition in india was that people used to go and take bath in river and there were not no no concept or uh, culture of taking bath in 4 by 4 or in bombay maybe 2 by 2 uh, mr ravindra mangal will bear me out for that but otherwise it was always that we used to dine in privacy because again there was a concept that whatever you eat that makes your uh, thoughts so as an that is the uh, that is how you are going to be man so that is why the concept was different privacy concept is totally different it is a superimposed concept on us but possibly that concept is required in present days because there is lot of possibility of misuse of data which is going to be available to people or those who are mischief mongers and that is why that particular privacy concept is that i am not condemning it let that continue and in the change circumstances it is very much required also so no difficulty on that then comes uh, a very important thing which as a judge i like to mention and that is about these guidelines i don't know whether you people have noticed it or not first thing these are the guidelines issued by board of governors i was really wonder wondering and as a judge i have habit to just find out what is this board of governors then that then the second line on that particular print is if i am able to show you this print you will find the second line is in supervision of the medical council of india then i just try to find out then they came that this board of governors is a new body uh, constituted and it in consultation with the niti ayog has issued these guidelines and not only that at one particular fine place they say in supervision of medical council 
it is very interesting reading therefore i am taking that uh, time to read this to you it says medical council oblique medical council of india from time to time it is clause 6 where it says special responsibilities of board of governors in super session to medical council of india and then in 6.1 it says any of the drug lists contained in telemedicine practice guidelines can be modified by the board of governors in super session of the medical council of india oblique what oblique medical council of india from time to time now these are you know the super technicalities of drafting and legislating and by that what is what is tried to be said is what is tried to be said is what is tried to be said is that medical council may change by the legislation from time to time and therefore whatever is the medical council and that is why medical council from time to time because there was a move the entire medical council system they want to to uh, change and until that change comes they have found a way out and that is board of governors they have uh, uh, empowered with to issue the guidelines now friends as you know guidelines are always directory in nature and they are not mandatory because until the guidelines are given the statutory form and until they are uh, passing through the entire procedure of making a statute they are not of that drastic consequences but that does not mean that you should take uh, liberty with the guidelines and you should try to uh, violate those guidelines until it is something justifiably uh, required to be done so friends that is about the second thing the third thing you will find doctors impression about their advice which is given is challenged in the court then only all these questions arise about the consent no consent trust no trust all these things come only when there is a possibility of doctors advice being challenged now that becomes or uh, that becomes an event possible on the when there is a mistrust between the two that is patient and the doctor the indian culture is that doctor was always a family part and a part of the family and he always used to be uh, you know the first invitee possibly in the uh, cultural celebrations in the family but then with the change of uh, you know times now that is not possible because when a person from the village comes to the city goes to a particular specialized doctor and takes his advice or say treatment it may not be that that specialized doctor becomes a family uh, friend or family part of that particular patient so that concept has uh, slowly gone in the background and that is why that particular thing is not uh, there but uh, uh, with this particular uh, seminar and with this particular discussion i am reminded of the jurisprudence uh, uh, subject which we which all the law students study especially one of our doctor is doing uh, Uh, LLB. Uh, uh, yes, sir. One one of the doctor is pursuing his LLB also. Yes, sir. Yes. So in that particular case, you will find the jurisprudence is the subject which says that law is something which is to govern the society, or law is meant for that particular purpose. But law is always law is always behind the needs of the society. Now today, when the telemedicine is halfway. uh the the we are yet to have a law governing that particular field and that is why my advocate batpai said that we should have a comprehensive law right it is but then that will take time until then our activism on judicial part if you remember that visakha judgment where in the sexual harassment at the working place the supreme court itself laid down the entire law but they put a they put a condition there that this law will operate because they know they 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 could notice and they knew that 
there was total absence of law in that particular field. So they said that whatever you have laid down in this particular judgment will continue until a competitive legislative body and its law governing this particular field. So that is the extent of activism which is expected of our uh, judicial uh, say the fraternity and the Supreme Court in particular and the constitutional courts that is high courts of the states that they always provide this type of uh, uh, say legislative part also. So friends, uh, 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 I think uh, this is some, some angles of the, from the judge's side which are I mean, uh, relevant to my mind and uh, to this discussion which we had. Telling medicine is having a vast future, but at the same time there are very, very, uh, you know, uh, I can say acute dangers of misuse of that particular information. If the modern technology can go to the extent of, you know, uh, influencing the election in the country, one or the other, then everything is possible. They can use all this particular data. I'm sorry for saying this because I'm in a wrong forum. I'm told that blood pressure standards are being changed from time to time. Look into the market of those particular um, pharmaceutical company who are manufacturing the drugs for BP. Recently, my doctor came and he measured my blood pressure. It was, uh, it should have been uh, 80, 8120. So he said, sir, 100 is there. It is normal side upside. But then taking into consideration two important factors. One is your uh, age. And uh, second thing, it is marginally high. So then it may not be treated to be high uh, blood pressure. Then interestingly, I looked into the literature available on our Google uh, doctor. So he said that these were go went on changing from time to time. And uh, he said, sir, there is no specific standard for anybody. They are generalization of the blood pressures which are maintained. Um, Dr. Ratna Devi is uh, giving a nice smile on this. Possibly she, she must be knowing more about it. That things change according to the pharmaceutical companies. And those pharmaceutical companies are MNCs, which have the budget more than the you know, majority of the countries in the world. And if they are having that much budget, they are always have a power to influence these particular things. So telemedicine as such is very good. As somebody very rightly said that we'll be able to reach to our you know, million uh, say brothers and sisters in the country, those who are not able to. But one most important thing which I like from Dr. Advocate Bajpayee is please don't cut paste from the West and apply to uh, our country, you know, without uh, proper application of mind or pro without proper editing or tailoring of that particular concept. Because I'm yet to, uh, yet to, yet to uh, come across a poor Adivasi from Dang in Gujarat or poor Adivasi from any part of the country is able to take advantage of this telemedicine. Of course, I, I, I may be wrong also because um, the, the number of uh, you know, mobile phones uh, sold in this particular country and held by the uh, all state of society, they may prove me wrong. There's no difficulty on that. But then I'll be too glad to be proved wrong in this particular case. But then their standard of understanding, their capacity to contact a particular doctor, and then to have these all questions is, is little different and little difficult also. Possibly it may happen that we will have then, you know, the doctors at his local place, they will be helping him in getting that telemedicine or telehealth um, services. They may come to that particular doctor, the doctor on their behalf consults and he specializes, uh, specializes the doctor and takes advice and then gives him treatment. That is possible. But otherwise, of its own, a person uh, reaches to that particular um, a specialized doctor is, is a far-fetched uh, dream. Friends, I appreciate your effort which you are putting and I really like uh, the way you people are discussing and are alive to all coming uh, you know, questions which are going to come in this particular uh, system of e-tele e medicine and e-health. Uh, friends, uh, with this, I'd like to uh, say thank you to everybody, especially uh, Mr. Sundar Rajan and uh, Ravindra Mangal who made me to run and uh, join this particular session a little late. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you uh, here. Uh, you all have been wonderful, wonderful, wonderful panelists. This was a great discussion. Uh, thank you so much.
and I would now like to hand over the proceedings to Mr. Ravindra Mangal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sundarajan, and thank you, everybody. Uh, let me now invite uh, our uh, COO, Mr. Agassi Matre, to offer the vote of thanks. Uh, over to you, Mr. Matre. Thank you, Ravi sir. Today, uh, we have a wonderful session for this national consultation. Now, uh, to go ahead with, we have already passed our 1230, di 1230 deadline. So, uh, respected, uh, respected Chairperson Justice Ravi Tripathi ji, esteemed panelists, viewers, colleagues from Institute of Medicine and Law, I thank you all from behalf of I am in India for putting your efforts and arranging this national consultation to a great success. We are grateful to Justice Ravi Tripathi ji. Special thanks to uh, Ravi sir, Sundar sir, for arranging this insightful session. Again for Sundar sir for moderating this social session so efficiently. Special thanks to our media partner, Express Healthcare, for your invaluable support. There are many more people who should be thanked specifically. But time is again a constraint. And once again, to one and all, those who have participated in this, a big thank you and for making it a grand success. Over to you, Ravi sir. So you're mute. Thank you, Agasti, for that wonderful note. And with that, I think it is time for us to call it a day. It was a wonderful session. I have received a suggestion from uh, Dr. Uh, Sequera to form a WhatsApp group to keep the discussions on. And by the end of the day, Dr. Sequera, I will have formed a group. And uh, I hope to take these uh, discussions ahead and come to a fruitful uh, end to these uh, deliberations which can then be passed on to the regulators so that we have the right rules, the right laws, the right processes in place. Like uh, Mr. Uh, like Dr. Uh, Suraj Dirwani pointed out, it has to be easy for the doctor, it has to be easy for the patient and something that uh, will help us really uh, greatly uh, to be able to, like Justice Ripati ji also said, to be able to reach the remotest corner of the country uh, so that we can help them uh, in their hour of need. Thank you, every much, uh, thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you for a wonderful session. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thanks for the time.